Hey, welcome. It's great to have you here for this guided meditation and Dharma talk. My name is Jonathan Faust. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. Uh, before we begin, I always like to start with some acknowledgments and thank yous. A big thank you to our producers, to Glenn Harrison and Leo Gimo for making this possible. There's a lot of technical stuff that goes into creating these live streams and the editing and all that good stuff. Also, a big thank you to our mindful movement teacher uh, for today and to our mindful dialogue leaders after the session. If you want a, the whole experience for Monday night, it's a really cool thing. Uh, Eastern Standard Time at 6.30, you can join Mindful Movement, um, really accessible movement that can help to prepare you for meditation, led by three wonderful teachers, or one of three wonderful teachers. At 7.30, we have this meditation that goes till about 8, and at 8 Eastern Standard Time, I launch into my talk, and afterward, usually about 8.45, um, a couple of minutes afterward, you can join Mindful Dialogue with Ray Maniocchi and Tara Cassidy. And it's an opportunity to share about the talk, to share about your practice, just to have some, some real-time connection with really nice folks. There's more about this. Uh, all the details for the Zoom links are on my Facebook page and also um, on my website. So feel free to check that out. A big thank you to the Insight Meditation Community of Washington for hosting this class and my friends at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, which hosts the Monday night class and have some wonderful resources such as the, the first, uh, first Light Meditation. Um, there's, all that stuff is on my website and also on my mailing list, so or on my newsletter. So if you like, I have a monthly newsletter which has a summary of all these talks, resources, and uh, my best photography for the month. And there's also a weekly which gives you a little update as to what's, what's coming up. Finally, or not quite finally, thank you for your support. I'm really inspired by these kind of core teachings in the Buddhist tradition where the teachings are considered priceless, so therefore there's no charge. It's offered freely, so no one's denied access. And generosity is also part of the practice, so if you feel inspired to be generous to keep this going, thank you so much. Um, again, you can check out my, my website for any any way to donate, either through Venmo and PayPal, stuff like that. So again, thank you. Mostly, I'm so grateful to be able to share these practices and uh, really, really glad you're here. Finally, the next big thing, a moment of shameless self-promotion. On May 21st, I will be offering a retreat on these questions that can, the questions that can change your life. It's exploring what we've been talking about for the last month or so, or what I've been talking about for the last month or so. Inquiry. How do you use questions to unravel the, the deeper issues going on in your life? So I'm looking forward to it. It's a Saturday retreat, May 21st, 930 to 4. Again, Eastern Standard Time. It's on Zoom. Uh, if you feel so inclined, please do come and join in. It's a really juicy experience. So on to meditation then. As much as I've been talking about inquiry, it's so, so important to remember the context of this practice and the context being present moment awareness, cultivating the sense of who you are as the observer of what's happening and exploring what it means to kind of let things be. As Einstein said, no problem was ever solved in the same consciousness that created it. So moving from this constantly commenting mind to present moment awareness is a very, very powerful way to explore what it means to be present and here. So I'll be offering kind of a classic meditation. Um, we're going to explore getting grounded in the senses, awake in the body. One of the best foundations for practice is deep, deep relaxation and receptivity. So we'll explore that. We'll explore this Again, the phrase I love is is really taking the seat of the witness and opening to the sense of flow, opening to a sense of what's changing, and sensing what it means to let things be, to actually shift into being the awareness itself, allowing. So if you're ready for the ride, take a few moments, let yourself find your posture. You might want to reach your arms up overhead, 
stretch out, let out any sounds. I know sometimes before I sit down to meditate, I'm thinking internally, oh, I have to meditate. And I find it helpful to substitute the phrase, I get to meditate. So you get to meditate. If you like, you can close your eyes. Take a moment just to allow yourself to arrive. This particular form, this particular tradition of meditation is about being awake in the senses. When you are aware and in the body, you've arrived. So notice right now, just notice the sounds. Notice the sense of touch. Externally, notice any pressure points. Yeah, can you feel the, the texture of your clothes against your skin? Internally, can you sense, as you scan through your body, is there anything you perceive inside that feels unpleasant? Maybe tight or sharp or congested, or stagnant. Is there anything inside that you perceive as pleasant, kind of free-flowing, easy, spacious, flowing? And is there anything you perceive internally that is kind of between the two, kind of just neutral, neither pleasant nor unpleasant? If you shift your attention to smell, what do you notice? Opening your awareness to taste, is there any lingering taste that you can perceive? Opening to sight, if your eyes are closed, is there a sense of the perception of the light beyond your closed eyes? And just notice now, is it possible to open all the sense doors simultaneously? And you might acknowledge the brain, really kind of considered one of the sense organs in this tradition. This processing center, taking all this external data and turning it into perception of who you are in time and space. You might let your awareness now move up to the crown of your head and to your scalp. And notice perhaps where you focus your attention, you'll also notice a heightened sense of perception. Any tingling or pulse here? If you bring the light of awareness to your forehead, maybe even to imagine your forehead smooth, what do you feel? Scanning the muscles around the eyes. Again, you might just notice, could you allow a sense of softening, a sense of kind of receiving the sensations right here at these little micro muscles around your eyes? Awareness now shifting down to explore the muscles of your face allowing the face to become utterly expressionless. And 
and the inside of the mouth. And sensing from the inside uh, the volume and the weight of your tongue. the root of the tongue. The volume of your lips. the back of the head and the base of the skull. And the back of the neck and the tops of the shoulders. Sensing from the inside out the length of the arms, the weight of the arms. The volume of your palms And the space inside your fingers. And the space inside your thumbs. And sensing from inside the throat. The lungs and the heart. the diaphragm and the rib cage. The lower back and the buttocks. Noticing how intimately you can detect the breath down deep in your belly. And sensing down through the floor, the pelvis, the hip joints. And from the inside out, sensing now the, the length and the volume of your legs down through the knees. And down through the ankles. the 
the tops of the feet and the toes. And the soles of the feet and the heels. Is there anything that could soften inside right now? From this place of deep relaxation and receptivity, you might very, very gently bring your attention to an anchor of your choosing, to the movement of the breath or to the sounds, maybe the feeling in the palms of the hands. Just perhaps for the rest of this meditation, letting this be your home base and the practice here for the next little while is to, with awareness, feel from the inside this point of contact with the breath inside or the vibration of sound or the felt sense in the palms. Your mind will naturally come in with commentary and prediction and review. And when you notice that, just notice it's possible to smile inwardly and then re-engage, relax, receive the moment here at the point of your anchor. Where is your attention right now? You might sense what could soften right now, what could relax inside. From this place of inner receptivity, re-engage with your anchor. A sense of arriving, of gathering. Is it possible to sense this seat of the witness, your capacity to observe without judgment, without preference, simply noting what is, what's changing? Is 
neither for nor against whatever is here. from this sense of the witness, you might notice your anchor as a focus of attention. You might also notice through this lens of the observer, the periphery, you know, the background, everything that's changing, the flow of sensations and thoughts and moods and states, the weather system, of your experience. And you might explore from time to time, moving from this sense of focusing on your anchor to shifting to the periphery, widening your attention, aware of all that is happening in all directions, and exploring what it means to let things be. When your mind gets lost or confused or drifting away, re-engage, relax, spend some time again with your anchor, arrive, and then again, if you like, broaden, widen, open into this sense of allowing and spacious presence. At any time, you can begin again, and you might, in these remaining five minutes, refresh the practice, exploring what could soften right now. The tongue, the palms, the belly and lower abdomen. The soles of the feet and the heels. Sensing from the inside out this quality of presence. embodied, relaxed awareness.
And you might explore what it feels like inside to blend a sense of deep relaxation with attention on your anchor. Sensing from the inside. This moment to moment shifting experience right here at the point of breath or sound or palms of the hands. Sensing this quality of witness consciousness, observing without preference, neither for nor against, but vibrantly awake. An opening to the sense of the flow, allowing everything to be just as it is, flowing, shifting, vibrantly alive. What could soften right now? What could let go? You might very gently notice the breath and perhaps just to lengthen the breath just a little bit on the end breath and Soften on the out breath. Noticing the quality of presence. Sensing what has shifted over this last period of practice. And you might, in your own time, let your head drift a little to the left and right. Take some time to let your body move and stretch, including this transition as part of your practice. How mindful can you be of tracking what feels good? You might reach your arms up overhead. Let out any sounds and take this time. Take this time for your transition. There's no hurry, no rush. Welcome. I just want to say we have some technical improvements to sound, I hope. Thank you for bearing with me if you've been listening to the live stream. Um, I think we've I, I've managed to solve the problem. And what do you know? We're talking about problem solving. <laughs> so here's a really awful story to start things off with. This poor woman's husband dies. And she tells the funeral home director that she 
wants him at the viewing to be in a blue suit. Funeral home director says, that's not a problem. Just bring in the blue suit and we'll, we'll set it up. And she says, well, I, I, we don't have a blue suit. Uh, only have a black suit. We really want a blue suit. And he says, well, I'm sorry, I don't have anything in stock, but if you can come in with a blue suit, that'd be great. She couldn't, she was upset. But then at the day of the viewing, there he is laid out in his beautiful blue suit. And she's just pleased, pleased beyond measure. She goes to the funeral director after and says, thank you so much for making that happen. What a, what a gift. It says, it's incredibly serendipity. Someone was brought in who had just died pretty much the same size you know, as your husband, and he was wearing this beautiful blue suit. So all I did was switch the heads. Sorry. <laughs> That's one way to solve a problem. And we've been exploring recently around working with problematic situations that you have in your life. And to get out of these or figure out these problems, you have to switch out of the linear rational mind. So that's one horrid example of someone solving a problem. <laughs> what I'd like to talk about um, are really three things I think I can get to, maybe four. But the first is just to kind of review the, the fundamental importance importance of cultivating mindfulness. It really is the foundation of exploring wherever you feel stuck. But second, I'd like to also talk about how, how you might be labeling something as a problem and how if you shift your label of it, that might actually shift your awareness. Pretty interesting stuff, all part of this whole concept of reframing. And the third thing I'd like to talk about is the, the concept of the ultimate reframe, which is having death as your advisor when you run into a problematic situation. And if we have time, I'd like to talk a little more about where this all points to, which is exploring awareness itself. Juicy stuff. I'm looking forward to it. So I was an English major in college. I went to a liberal arts school, and as part of my liberal arts degree, I had to take some science classes. And one of them was a course that was uh, officially entitled Physics for Poets, which was unofficially titled <laughs> Physics for Idiots. I remember very little about that class other than the fact that myself and a few of my friends were deeply convinced that the professor was an alien. At one point, he said, I want you all now to stand up. And we thought, we just looked at each other and said, it's happening. Very, very sweet guy. But there was something about him that was a little otherworldly. But out of all of that, the little that I recall from that, I do recall, or at least I think I recall, how Einstein developed his theories. So he had, a, he had an idea, he had a perception of a, of a scientific reality. But then he had to solve it. He had to prove it. So, so he, he had to open up his, his intuition. He had to access his, his problem-solving capabilities. And he did what, what were called thought experiments. And among them was imagining that he was chasing a beam of light, that he was riding a photon around the universe. Another was imagining accelerating elevators and the effect that that would have on the perception of time. And yet another was, another famous one was uh, a lightning strike that's viewed by a person standing still and a person on a train. Would their perception be different? He was investigating through the linear mind, but also having to open up to new information. And in the same way, you can explore what it's like to investigate from, from different perspectives or different planes of consciousness. So here's a little Zen pop quiz for you. If you'd like, if you could close your eyes, you don't have to, but if you like, you can close your eyes. And just where do you notice your breath right now? Where do you feel the breath the strongest inside? And what happens if you just observe the experience of your breath on the inside right now?
And you may notice there's sort of this object subject, like you are aware of the breath. So as, as you, as you continue, you might just explore this phrase, just either repeat the phrase internally. That might be one way to do it, or just reflect on the phrase. I am aware of the breath. I am aware of the breath. And now, if you would, drop the words of the breath and just explore the phrase, I am aware. And now, if you would, drop the word aware and explore the phrase, I am. Now drop the word M and explore the phrase I. And now drop the sense of I and just pause. What do you notice? Did, did anything shift in this short reflection? If you like, you can deepen the breath. You can open your eyes or remain with the eyes closed. I, I love this little exercise because it points toward the sense of, of no eye. <laughs> what, what is there without an eye? And as the Buddha allegedly and famously said, nothing whatsoever is to be clung to as I or mine. And when that sense of I or mine becomes porous or falls away, there's a, there's a shift. And it might have just been a millisecond that you may have sensed something shifting to the sense of no I. <laughs> and usually, our, we're, we're looking for solutions in problem solving. We've got a lot of real world issues. How can I save money and live within my means? Uh, how can I save enough money for when I get older? How do I deal with this difficult person in my life? What kind of car should I buy next? Should I leave my job or should I focus on my attitude about my job? These are the kind of questions that we're, we deal with on a daily basis. and. Uh, every day, it's what do I eat? What should I wear? Those are the smaller problems, but then we kind of got the bigger problems, but they're only solved when we pause and we listen, and in some sense, when we shift our awareness. I love this story. This busy dad is has the task of babysitting his young daughter. He's got a lot of work to do. He's got his computer, his laptop open. And his daughter's pretty needy. She wants a lot of attention. She wants interaction. And he saw a magazine page with a, with a finely detailed map on it. He got an idea. He tore the page out and he, he tore it up into tiny little pieces. And he said, here's, here, honey, here's a puzzle. Why don't you put this puzzle together? And she very eagerly took all the pieces of paper and, and went into her room. And he was so grateful. He had this time. He turned back to his laptop. But in about three minutes, she was back with the map completed, all taped together. And he was stunned. He said, how did you do that? And she said, well, on the other side of the map was a woman's face. And it didn't take me very long. What do we do now? <laughs> she looked at this problem from a different perspective. And voila, solution. And I find this so interesting. Because in, in mindfulness meditation or in Vipassana meditation, we are exploring what it's like to see into the nature of reality. And to see into the nature of reality, you have to, you have to shift out of the linear rational mind. We have to shift our awareness, kind of reframe the situation. And oftentimes, an insight will come into your life when you've had this shift in awareness. 
And you could even say it's sort of a shift in identity. Again, the sense of the I falling away. And it's interesting how if we view life as suffering and the end of suffering, it's problems and the end of problems. And quite often when we're, when we're hounded by problems, we have all these unresolved kind of troubling issues that are sometimes above the line of what we're aware of and quite often they're kind of below the line. And if you've managed to minimize the pain of your problems, you might think you've solved it. But it's quite possible that, that all you've done is devote time and energy to avoiding it. And this is where the, the analogy of the thorn is so helpful. That when you have a thorn in your paw, what you need is sort of another thorn to kind of dig that out. It's like when you, when you sense that, that, that there's something troubling, when you've got that thorn in your paw, you have to stop and you have to look at it and you have to dig it out. You have to turn directly toward the issue at hand. And so here we have this wonderful acronym of RAIN, which you may be familiar with. The R is to recognize or realize what's presenting. The A is to sense if you can allow it or, or accept it. And it's always important to acknowledge sometimes you can't, it's too much. You don't have the resources, you don't have the time or the energy in which case is very, very skillful to let it know you see it. Let it know another time when the conditions are different, you can be with it. But if you can, you can then move into the eye of rain, which is to investigate, to look closely, to look at that thorn. And there's some questions that you can ask. What is this? What am I feeling? What's the attitude in my mind? Am I trying to hold on? Am I, am I trying to push something away? Can I make room for it? Where does this live in my nervous system? Can, can I locate it? This feeling of disquiet, this feeling of pain or stress or suffering, how old is it? Can I, can I trace it back? How does this impact my view of life? What am I believing about this? What am I needing that's not happening? Can I bring some loving awareness to this. These are some of the questions that, that allow you to turn toward the, the thorn, to turn toward the problem or, or the issue. So in mindfulness, it's about being fully present, being in the here and now. It's noticing what's here. It's about noticing the attitude in your mind. It's about noticing all the conditions of how you're holding it, all this stuff. But it's also about noticing if you can access loving presence. It's also, and this is where it gets a little woo-woo, it's about noticing who's noticing. <laughs> and when you have that perspective of what some call the witness or the observer, non-judging, non-preferential, just observing what is, you can begin to see the patterns of perception, the, the habitual patterns of how you've been relating to it. And you can sometimes see into the nature of seeing itself. It's cool. <laughs> so this principle of reframing, sort of like changing the kind of changing the frame is very, very powerful. Can I be the objective observer of what's happening? Can I observe my thoughts? And one of the most powerful things I experience when I'm on a retreat or in a deep meditation, and it happens every time, and I've been at this for decades, <laughs> is this realization that I don't have to believe every thought. Just part of the stream that's passing through. So it's about observing these thoughts, observing the perceptions. And, and I want to pause here. This is something you know, that I've just sort of run across just personally is one of these powerful thoughts among the 60,000 thoughts we think a day is I want to be free. And if you just sense that for a moment, 
I want to be free. Can you imagine that if just for a moment, what it would be like to feel free, to feel free from stress, to feel free from wanting, to feel free from hatred. It's a powerful thought. And in order to be free, we have to look at what's here, what's happening right now. And more than that, we have to look at how we're relating to it, to the attitude in the mind. Any variation from simply being with it, any variation into wanting it different is going to bring in some form of stress, some form of rope burn. And so when we look toward problem and problem solving, there's all the solution-based approaches, but then there are the more radical approaches, which I'd like to share with you. The teacher, Locke Kelly, offers up a very powerful question. Again, a, a really powerful question you can ask yourself. And there are a couple of variations to it, but, but the one that, that he uses is, what is here if there is no problem to be solved? Sometimes I ask myself, what's, what's, what's happening inside? if there's no problem to be solved. On the first blush, this question can be a, a little intellectual exercise. But if you stay with it, and so much of the practice of inquiry and deeper inquiry is really about drilling down, staying with the question. Because quite often these questions can, can deeply unravel how you're relating to your life and how you're relating to reality. I'm a naturally anxious person, just part of my, part of my, <laughs> part of the conditions uh, into which I entered this world. I can tell you a whole story about that, but I won't. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was inspired to take on, take this on. And um, for pretty much every year, for quite a few years, Tara and I would go to the forest refuge in Barrie, Massachusetts and in February when there was no one there or very few people there. And I decided to kind of take this on as my practice. And, and I would just, just lightly inquire, what, what's here if there's no problem to be solved? Because I noticed how my mind is sort of like moving toward anticipating what might kill me. <laughs> and trying to solve it. And so it was this sort of a constant process of noticing how I would clench around some anxiety. Because quite often what happens is you, when you still the mind, this undigested stuff comes up. And, and for me, it sort of comes up with this flavor of distrust, just not trusting life. That's kind of what I get to work with. And so I would sort of notice it and then just sort of ask, so what's here if, if this is not a problem to be solved? And I kind of feel this, uh, a little bit of a dispelling of that tension. So during the course of, of the retreat, I was also monitoring my phone because there was no one monitoring the phone for me. And um, I was anticipating problems. <laughs> and Lo and behold, one day I got an urgent call from our house sitter and there were some problems with the water pressure and it would kind of got chronic over a couple of days. And I ended up, I called our plumber to have a, the plumber come and check it out. And um, I got this urgent call. So at 10.30 at night, February, central Massachusetts, really, really cold, really, really windy. I'm sitting in my car taking this call. And the, the plumber was um, pretty dramatic. 
he said something along the lines of like, it's a nightmare. It's like the Mississippi River here. We got a busted pipe. It's out of control. I got to shut down. I've looked at it. We got major damage. We're going to have to take, we're going to take out the flooring and take out the insulation and put it back. I hope you're sitting down. This is going to be at least $10,000 to fix this. I was so grateful for my practice because I, I, I heard that and there was the clench and then there was sort of like the relief that at least we had it handled now. And then just automatically the question came, so what's here if this is not a problem to be solved? I'm so grateful I had that practice because part of the realization for me is that if it's not a problem to be solved, then this is just my interpretation, that it's, then it's just an experience to be met. And this is so powerful how questions can open up new possibilities. When I am anticipating a problem, I'm automatically coming at it from a very narrow point of view. If it's not a problem to be solved, then suddenly I've got a lot more options. I have a lot more relaxation, a lot more ease. I can use my intuition to explore some different ways that I might relate to it. So I'd like to offer a little reflection. And, and, if, you, and if you would, try not to jump ahead to the question. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to think of a little problematic situation, take some time to kind of like feel it inside, and then we'll kind of explore what happens with that inquiry for you. So if you'd like, you can close your eyes. And you might slow down your breath again, not required that you uh, that you close your eyes. And you might just take a few moments and do a little inventory and you would just think of a perhaps just a small irritation that's going on in your life. Something that's between you and feeling happy. And if you could just sort of name it, just give it a name, the issue. Sense, is it okay to spend a little time with it just the next few minutes? If not, you might choose another. And if so, you might take a few moments just to move into the investigation here. What's this like inside? What's the attitude in your mind? Are you, are you wanting something? Are you pushing something away? Can you locate what it feels like inside? If you'd like to amplify what this feels like, you might ask yourself, oh, what, is, what does this feel like at its most chronic? And again, just sense how your nervous system holds this issue. And then allow yourself to explore the following question. What's here if this is not a problem to be solved? And listen inward. You might take a moment to just sense, did, did, did anything shift? You might not have, maybe nothing. Maybe a little glimpse, a little shift. And if you like, you can open your eyes or remain with your eyes closed. You know, there's that phrase, which I imagine you've heard, if you're a hammer, all you see are nails. And conversely, if, if you are a separate self, then all you see is separation. Kind of beyond that, if you are loving presence, there's a different view. So this is kind of a radical practice of, of, of shifting your attention toward awareness itself, toward kind of reframing. Now, there's a word of caution. You know, almost every practice has some, some kind of contraindication. And if you kind of go around and just simply flippantly say, well, what if this is not a problem to be solved? 
you might notice that it, it invokes something called premature transcendence <laughs> or spiritual bypassing. It's that whole attitude of like, oh man, it's not a problem to be solved. It's just empty, man. <laughs> it's a great strategy for those of us who are fond of disassociation. So just to be aware, if this becomes a tool for spiritual bypass, or if it might be a helpful way to sort of reframe and then engage in a more mindful way. And for me, again, it's when I practice this and I can sort of feel that shift from a tightly bound self trying to figure it out or self-protect, if it's not a problem to be solved, then it's an experience to be met with awareness and with compassion and with, with intuition with more fluidity, more openness. So this is one of my, one of my most powerful reframes, but here's, here's another, which is maybe even more potent, a really juicy way to switch things up. Uh, I don't know why I'm talking about college so much uh, in this talk, but uh, here I am back in college. I had a specialty in college. Uh, my specialty was buying really cheap, old, beat up motorcycles and having them die while I owned them. <laughs> my first motorcycle was $75 and I drove that for like two years, never did anything to it. And then um, the second bike I had was a, a really beat up bike, but it cost me a lot more money, it was $300. And for those uh, motorcycle nerds, it was the Honda CB77 Superhawk, uh, 305cc. It's a really, really cool bike, but it was a mess. It was the, the heads were all screwed up and it was really loud. And But I ran it for a long time and uh, a friend of a friend was interested in buying it. Really, really nice guy. I really liked him. I remember he was a hockey player and very, very bright, very friendly. And because I liked him, I assured him the bike was a piece of garbage, but he really wanted it. So um, he signed the, uh, the title and um, drove it off, and he told me he'd have the money the following week. And to my shock, um, about three days later, someone told me that he died. Uh, he died in his sleep, some kind of brain swelling. And there was something about that experience that really shook me up. How, how could that be? This healthy, strapping, friendly, engaged guy, gone. I have to admit that for about two seconds at his funeral, I, I thought of mentioning the $300 to his mother, <laughs> but I, I thought better of it. But something about that experience just rocked me to my core. I've been around death a lot. I grew up on farms, you know, um, but someone so close to my age like that, just gone. And so for some period of time, and I can't remember how long, there was just this like remembrance, this remembrance of just this voice just saying, live your life fully, take risks was so powerful. And then after a while, I felt so alive and so engaged in my life. And then I noticed that that, that charge just started to fade. And I sort of reverted back to this anxious person on his way somewhere. And maybe you've had that experience where you've been touched closely by death and you feel that poignancy, the, the fragility of life, the, the impermanence of life, and then it fades. And we move from remembering the preciousness of life to forgetting. So another Zen pop quiz, if you, if you wish. Again, you can close your eyes or have your eyes open. And you might take three slow breaths. And as you breathe out, just take a few moments to relax and soften inwardly.
a new mate. Bring into mind and into heart someone you were close to who's no longer here, who's no longer alive. It might be helpful to kind of visualize them, kind of sense their presence. And you might sense their, their aliveness, their, the, the joy that they had in this life. And you might sense how, how their fear held them back from being fully alive. And then if you would, exploring this question, take a few moments just to listen inwardly as you think of this person. What advice might they offer you right now? Carlos Castaneda wrote this. When you need an answer, look over your left shoulder and ask your death. Death is your eternal companion. It is always to your left, an arm's length behind you. Death is the only wise advisor that a warrior has. Whenever you feel that everything is going wrong and you're about to be annihilated, you can turn to your death and ask if this is so. Your death will tell you that you're wrong, that nothing really matters outside its touch. Your death will tell you, I have not touched you yet. This concept of having death on your left shoulder as, as your advisor. So powerful. For me, when I think of my death, it brings in a tremendous sense of gratitude for this life, but also a sense of, of what's undone. Kind of the regrets, the kind of unprocessed sadness and quite often a sense of how much of this life I missed because I was so busy on my way somewhere. If you're caught in comparison with another person or if you're jealous of another person and you consult death as your advisor, it's a very powerful practice. Having death on your, on your left shoulder as your advisor is an invitation to, to live your highest, most engaged life. Of course, there's a shadow side to this. The shadow side or the contradiction of sort of dwelling on death is it can lead to a sense of fatalism. It can lead to a sense of indifference. But again, if you stay with it, you might find that it reveals some, some deeper truths and it can be a powerful force for inner guidance. Having your death as your personal advisor is perhaps one of the most dynamic ways of reframing a problematic situation. It's another way of, of opening to this shift in identity. <clears throat> and it can be incredibly, and just incredibly potent. There's this old classic joke. A husband is in his hospital bed. His wife is there next to him. And he's on the edge of his death. And he says, you know, I just, 
I just had a big realization of how you're always there. You were there that time I fell off the roof cleaning the gutters and I broke my leg. You were there that time when I was fired and I didn't know what to do. You were there that time when I lost all that money in the stock market. It's only now that that I'm realizing you're, you've been bad luck. <laughs> you know, there's that inquiry of like, who's always there when things go wrong? Every time, who's there? You. And who's always there when you have incredible times of joy and insight? Again, it's you. But then the question becomes, well, who are you? Who are you really? Again, when you are identified with this tightly bound self, everything can look like a problem to be solved. And everything becomes built around self-preservation, preserving that sense of self, protecting your particular point of view. As Einstein said, again, no problem was ever solved in the same consciousness that created it. When you're stuck, when you're in a rut, when you can't figure it out, you have to shift your consciousness. So sometimes asking questions like the, the five problem-solving questions are incredibly powerful. You got a problem, you ask yourself, okay, what could be great about this? What's not perfect yet? What am I willing to do to resolve this? What am I no longer willing to tolerate? And how can I get excited about developing mastery as I resolve this issue? Those are very powerful reframes because you move from a shift from focusing on the problem to opening to the possibility. And as you explore investigating when you're caught, when you're investigating when you're stuck, getting familiar with this is so powerful. Getting familiar with the thorn in your paw, really stopping to look at it, sensing how old it is, getting familiar with it, exploring what it's like to bring loving presence to it, sometimes here, calling on mindfulness, present moment awareness, noticing what's happening, noticing the attitude in your mind, calling on kindness, loving presence. It can open up this shift. Again, a shift in consciousness, a shift in awareness that opens you up to new insights. Sometimes just noticing, again, the attitude in your mind, noticing when you're caught in a problem to ask yourself, what is here if this is not a problem to be solved? Can be a really potent way of shifting the frame, accessing more ease, more of a capacity to respond. And exploring, and this phrase I love from Deepak Chopra, opening up to the field of infinite possibility. I just love that phrase. <laughs> and finally, what would it mean to have your death on your left shoulder as your advisor? How does that inform your perspective? When you sense that, that this tightly bound self is destined to fall away, and you can begin to sense that powerful teaching that nothing whatsoever is to be clung to as I or mine. Again, this field of infinite possibility becomes accessible. And just as any practice has its counterbalances is to notice when you're using problem, problem solving as a way to bypass the inner work. Acknowledging the, 
where it's really caught and stuck, but also using it as a way to open, to keep opening to the mystery. Again, to the sense of, of who you are beyond this tightly bound sense of I and mine. It's juicy stuff. I really hope you find have found this helpful. We have just a minute or so left, so why don't we take a few moments just to kind of close our eyes. If you like, you can deepen your breath. You might slow down the breath. And just sensing this, the potency of the essential practice here. What is happening right now? Can you sense this quality of the witness, the observer, non-judging, non-preferential, just this awake, unblinking eye of awareness, noticing not only what's here, but noticing the attitude in the mind, noticing the flow, how you might constrict the flow, and also how you might open and widen to the mystery of this unfolding moment. You might take these final moments to wish yourself well. Feel and imagine yourself opening to your path with a greater sense of ease a greater sense of well-being. More and more available to the moment. And more and more available to your life, to your relationships, to your commitments, to your responsibilities. Engaged, awake, open, and guided by this sense of open heart and open mind. As you're ready, you can deepen your breath. As you're ready, you can open your eyes. And thank you so much for your time and attention. Best wishes to you. And I look forward to being with you again.